Okay, so I think that I'm going to start with this one. I am going to speak about common vulnerabilities in Solidity smart contracts. And first of all, I am going to introduce myself. My name is Roberto Reigada. I'm a senior offensive security engineer in Halvord. And my role in Halvor is perform Solidity smart contract audits. Uh, some of the projects that I have audited in the past are ApeCoin, uh, Binstock, which is an algorithmic stablecoin, SushiSwap, uh, SushiSwap Trident, which is an automated market maker, and I also audited uh, the launch of the, the other side. Um, so this is the different topics that I am going to mention. Uh, they are a little bit small from what you can see here. But yeah, I am going to start by uh, listing all the common bugs in Solidity. I am going to uh, speak about logic errors, rentrancy, arithmetic issues, financial attacks, uh, upgradeability issues, signature replay attacks, and weak pseudo-random number generation. So this is the list of, the, of what I consider the most common bugs that I find in my audits. Um, and yeah, let's start with the logic errors. Like, this is the most common bug type, and it's pretty much everywhere. Like, the, the higher complexity of a project, the higher likelihood of finding any, any logic error. So every single Solidity project with some degree of complexity, I will have, always have to follow some rules, some flows, and the, the, most complex that, the more complex that that project is, the easier for the developer to miss like a required statement that is critical, right? So about this, you can really build two tools to find, for example, rentancy vulnerabilities, but to, to cover all the logic errors, to, to make sure that, uh, that a project is working as intended, there is no way to, there is no tool that can do that. So you really need a, a, human, a human mind be, uh, behind that to audit this code. So I am going to start, uh, I really love to, to put examples to understand uh, what a logic error is. So I'm going to start with this one. Uh, this is one of my previous audits. It was a lending protocol where users could borrow some assets. Uh, basically, uh, when uh, one of those uh, assets uh, or one of those positions become, uh, becomes insolvent, anyone will be able to, to call a function called start action. And there was an incentive to, to call that function, uh, which means that the first caller uh, will get uh, some uh, a token minted to them. The, the token that was minted to them was called USP, which is an stable coin. Um, so basically, this is the different functions. Uh, I guess that it is a bit small for you, but you can see here, this is the start action function. You can see here that how the incentive is calculated. The incentive is set here by the owner of the, of the smart contract. And here, the, the first caller will receive the USP amount, right? So there is like an incentive for the first person that, that calls this function. Uh, so what could happen here? OK, so there is an incentive, right? What happens if uh, you, as a hacker, you decide to open like 100 different or 1,000 different positions, and you make sure that uh, those positions positions in the future are going to become insolvent. So you open 1,000 different positions. Those positions will become insolvent. And you are aware of this. So you, as attacker, call the start action in a batch way for all those positions. And you make sure that the gas cost of calling uh, uh, the, the start auction for those 1,000 positions are going to be less than the incentive that you get. So you are exploiting the the project, you are receiving an incentive that you just generated for yourself, which is higher than the gas cost that you spend. So here you are quite exploiting the, the project. So this is another case study, another, another uh, logic error. This was found by me uh, the, previous, the previous week. And basically, this is a project that was hacked like a few months ago, quite famous, for like what you see there, uh, 182 million. Um, you probably uh, saw the hack. I don't want to mention the name. You will probably find out uh, in the next slides, but I don't really want to mention the, the name directly. So the, this project was hacked, uh, and they started working to, to relaunch. Well, we were auditing uh, the previous code that was hacked and the new code that they added for this relaunch. In that new code, 
And in the previous code, we found multiple critical issues. Those issues were all fees. Uh, so they relaunched, and afterwards, they kept pushing different updates to the to their smart contracts, right? Uh, those changes that they were pushing was code that was never audited by us or by any other firm. So a week ago, we signed a new deal with this project, and I started auditing that. I started auditing that new code. So the first thing, the first thing that I did was like comparing the last commit ID of the code that I had audited for this project with the new one that they that they gave me. So one of the things that really got my attention was that they renamed this function from ripen to chop. So so you understand a little bit what this function does. Basically, uh, before these guys were exploited, uh, they had like a like a token. They had a token, right? That token, once they uh, they they were exploited, that token is worth zero uh, at the day now. But there there were many holders. So now that they relaunch, they have a new token, and they created like a mechanism for people that uh, invested before in this project to convert the previous token before the hack and get the new token after the hack, the one that got value at the moment. So for that, they created this function. Uh, this function, before they called it Ripen, now it's called Chop. This function allows you to uh, provide the old token, the token that, uh, that was working before the hack, and in exchange, you get the new token. The new token that you're going to that is working now, the, the stable coin itself. So this is uh, how the smart contracts work. Uh, basically, they have different types of uh, transfer. They have different modes. Let's say that they have external mode, where if you want to send tokens into the smart contract using the external mode, you uh, the tokens are taken from your wallet. Then the standard normal transfer, the tokens are taken from your wallet and the tokens go to the smart contract. Then they have the internal mode, because uh, this project got like some internal balance. So basically, with the internal mode, you can, uh, your internal balance of this token is decreased, and the token is used by the smart contract. And then they have a mode which is called internal tolerant. Here is the, here is the problem. Basically, this, uh, this mode uh, allows you to, uh, let's say, um, to tell to the, to the smart contract that, okay, let's use 100, uh, 100 tokens, and then the smart contract checks your internal balance, and if you only have 50 tokens, not 100, the smart contract will handle that and will use only the 50 tokens for all the operations, and it will be like if you had passed to the smart contract those 50 tokens. So what happens here? They changed, after, the, after my last audit, they had changed the function, and they added a bar token function, and basically they allowed users to to decide which from mode they wanted to use for for the for calling the chop function. So this is the chop function. If we go back to the previous slide, you, we can see that bar token will always return the actual amount that was bar, because if you use internal tolerant mode. You can, for example, pass 50. I mean, you can, for example, pass 100. And if, you, if your internal balance only has 50, bar token will return 50. And because that's the real amount that you're actually burning, not 100. So you cannot, let's say, lie to the smart contract. But we can see here that they are using the bar token function. This is a parameter that can be called by the user, that can be specified by the user. but they are calling here bar token, but they are not checking the value. So this is this is like this is the issue itself. So what happens here? What can you do? So any attacker can put here can use the internal tolerant mode. Then he can say that he's passing. He's gonna burn like one million tokens. This is going to uh, this is going to try to well. They are we are using the internal mode, the internal tolerant mode. So this is called. The internal balance of the user is checked, uh, but that user only got zero tokens, got no tokens at all. But as we are, the smart contract is not checking the return value of this. The smart contract is thinking that the user actually, after this call, had burned like one million tokens. So we are sending the user the new token based on this amount that we specify here. So we are like draining the whole contract. 
So this is the, this was my face when I found this, this issue. I was very happy and scared at the same time. Um, yeah, this is what I just explained. Contract will assume that the full amount of tokens passed by the user has been burned and will mean the respective new tokens to the coder. So the attacker can print money non-stop and exploit the protocol. This is the proof of concept that I built. So I am here loading, this is a browning script that I built. I am loading here the address of the smart contract and I am showing here that I have no beans, I have no rib beans. I just told you beans so you know already what the project is. And here we're calling the chop function. We're saying that we want to take from our, inter using the internal tolerant mode, we want to burn uh, 1,000 million of unripped beans, which we don't have because here is zero. The operation doesn't revert and we get back. This is like uh, 48 millions of beans. One bean is one dollar, so we just got rich here. This is, like a, this is done in a fork environment, so this was sent to the customer. And after that, they put this uh, notification in Discord saying that the chop function was vulnerable and they remove it. And here, some guy very smart said, like, they almost got chop once again. <laughs> so, yeah, this is the typical bug that everybody knows about when we are talking about solidity, rentrancy. So every time that we do a external call to another untrusted contract, uh, some issues can happen. In this case, this is the typical flow that happens when you are sending a native asset to a smart contract, that the smart contract can uh, implement some malicious uh, code in the fallback function. So that's the, the common rentrancy vulnerability, right? But I want to show another case. This is, a, this is another real case. This, is, this was not an audit. This was just a public project that was launched like a year ago. These guys were not exploited. They were lucky, but they, they have like a terrible, a terrible rentrancy here. Uh, the project already minted everything, so there is no way to exploit this anymore. But I really wanted to use this project to, to show this, right? So, first of all, we can see here that they are picking the number of tickets that the user has with this function here. And then, for each number of tickets, they are minting one NFT to that user. But, after this mint function is called, they are here uh, updating the amount that they claim already after this call. So, when we see safe min, we think, oh, okay, safe min, should be safe, right? That's not the case, it's the other way around. Like, if we are looking into the, uh, into the open sampling contract, we can see that the min function, the only thing that it does is just updating this mapping, increasing the balance of the tokens that the user has of the collection, and then updating the owner's mapping, saying that this ID will be owned by this wallet. And that's it. There is nothing else uh, at all that is done here. Just a few checks, but the, the, real, uh, the, the only variables that are updated are balance mapping and owners. There are no more calls. But if we check the safe mint, it's pretty much the same. Mint is called, but they added this required statement here check on ERC721 receive. So, let's check what uh, that require statement does. Here we have that function, which will be called, and that function, what it does is, checks if the address that is going to receive the NFT is a smart contract. If that address is a smart contract, uh, it will call the on ERC721 receive function that should be declared in the smart contract. Why was this implemented like this? Okay, so imagine that you send an NFT to, to a smart contract that uh, is not aware that is gonna receive that NFT. That NFT will be stuck in that smart contract forever. So this is the reason that the developers uh, decided to, to create SafeMint, to make sure that the smart contracts, to check that the smart contracts are aware that we're gonna send them NFTs. But the problem here is that you are calling an external function of, a, of another contract and this function can implement malicious code. So, getting back to this, what we, what we can do here. Okay, so we buy a single ticket, we create and deploy a smart contract. Uh, the smart contract deployed 
has this on ERC721 receive function that calls, let's say, 20 times uh, the claim docs function. And as this mapping is not updated the, uh, before the external call, the attacker will be able to mean as many NFTs as he wants with just a single ticket. Uh, it's not exactly as many NFTs as he wants because we, we have a gas limit in Ethereum, which will be uh, 30 million, right? But pretty much all the ticket, I mean, pretty much until reaching the, the, the gas limit. So what will happen here? We bought, we bought a ticker, we, we, we bought a ticket, number of tickets will be one. We're gonna, uh, save me will be called. This will call the on ERC721 receive function in our smart contract. This line won't be executed yet, so this function will call again claim docs. This will return one again. We are going to mint another one. This will call again on year C in our smart contract. We are going to call this again, 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 again. We are doing that until, let's say, 20, 30 times, and then this variable will be updated. But that's it. It's going to be too late. We already exploited the smart contract. So. Let's talk now about arithmetic issues. So uh, this includes overflows, underflows in Solidity versions before 0, 0.8.0. 0. After this version, the compiler already checks automatically if there are overflows and underflows. But the compiler doesn't check uh, in this version, doesn't really check if type castings can cause uh, an overflow and underflow. There are also an over error that can happen pretty often, which is rounding and loss of precision errors, which can happen mostly when there are divisions. So this is one of the one of the issues that I found recently. So I know again that this is too small, so sorry for that. But uh, basically here we are doing multiple divisions, and this is a downcasting, right? So I'm going to sum this up, but. Each reward depth subtraction in the withdraw function always gets rounded down. Here, this division always causes that there is rounding down. So if a user withdraws or do a partial withdraws multiple times, this will keep losing precision more, 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 and more. And this will cause that the pending rewards will overflow and that the users in the smart contract will not be able to ever claim their rewards. They will be able to withdraw their funds but let's say that if they had their, uh, their tokens staked in the smart contract for a year, they won't be able to get the rewards out, out of, of the smart contract. Quite annoying. So this is a proof of concept script that I built. So we can see that after multiple partial withdrawals, the loss of precision caused here that the operation reverts and the user is able to withdraw, yeah, but he won't be able to claim his rewards is reverting every single time. So it's, let's say that it's not a critical issue because it's something that it's, it's quite an edge case that is caused by the user, but it's quite a big problem because the content is actually not fulfilling the, its main purpose, right? To give properly, properly the rewards to the, to the users. So this is what I just said. Users that have performed multiple partial withdrawals will get a rewards lock. And yeah, imagine that initially you stake one million tokens, and the first two weeks you decide to withdraw some of the tokens, then you leave that stay there for a year, and one year later you come, but you get that error in the smart contract, you will be really annoyed. So now we're going to speak a little bit about financial, financial attacks, and the most common financial attacks are Oracle price manipulation attacks, and we could also put here flash loans. So. So this is a, an over audit that I did a few months ago. Basically, it was a governance smart contract. In that smart contract, uh, people could create different proposals. And the proposals, the voting power for the proposals was calculated based on the balance of X bond tokens. So now you're thinking, how can I get X bond tokens? Okay, there are uh, bond tokens, and they had like a staking contract where you could stake bond tokens and receive X bond tokens. This is the, the code of the smart contract. This is the enter function. Here you place uh, bond tokens and you receive S bond, as you can see. 
And here is the leaf function where you just burn the S bone tokens and you receive the, the bone tokens. So, well, first of all, there is like, we can say that there is an issue here because you're actually not staking here at all. Like, you can call enter and call leave at the same time. So, you can do that in a single transaction. There is no restriction. Uh, a cooldown here must be enforced to avoid multiple attacks, but that's not the point. So uh, this is the, the issue here, basically. Uh, we can see that uh, all the users, we create a proposal, and we started voting that all the users, the, the proposal is malicious. Let's say that the proposal wants to give us the ownership of the whole protocol. So users don't really want that. They are voting that false, that they don't agree with the, with the proposal. But here, uh, we do a flash loan attack, and we manage to get the executor role. Like, we can see that our, let me see, kernel executor. Yeah, we can see that the governance got the executor role, which is the highest role in the protocol. This is the same average, right? And this is my, my, my exploit contract. After executing the flash loan and exploiting the smart contract, I managed to change the executor role to the address that I wanted, in this case, my, in this case, my smart contract. So how this, this happened? So basically, what I did, let's get back to, the, to this function. There was, I knew that there was a pool of bond tokens since Uniswap. But I tried taking a, fast, a flash loan directly uh, with Aave of bond tokens, but I was not able to do it. So what I did was taking a flash loan of USDC tokens, using that Uniswap pool to swap. Actually, I, I have everything here. I took a flash loan of USDC, as, this was, as there was no way to obtain a flash loan of bond tokens directly. I swapped the USDC tokens for bond tokens. I lock the bond tokens to get X bond tokens in the contract that, that I saw you before. So now here, our voting power is really, really high. We can do pretty much what we want. So I create the proposal. I vote for my own proposal. I execute it. And even if, even if people already voted no, doesn't matter because I have more power than them. And then I reclaim the votes. Then I unstake. And then I burn the X bonds. Then I swap bond tokens that I receive after burning the X-Bond, and I repay the flash loan of USDC. So this is exactly what is happening here, and that's how we managed to, to get the control of this protocol. So what's, the, what's this issue here? This issue, well, one of these issues is what I mentioned before. They allow you to enter and leave. They allow you to stake and unstake in a, in a single transaction. There is no cooldown around that. And the protocol, the, the governance contract, calculates the voting power based on the current amount of X bond tokens. If you check multiple governance contracts, you will see that the governance contracts usually don't check the current amount of tokens that you have to calculate the voting power. They check the amount of tokens that you have, but in the previous block. For that, they use like some mechanism like snapshots and, and so on, right? So this. This is actually the code, which, uh, well, cannot be seen very well by you, I guess. It's pretty much what is written here. So yeah, this is another case, uh, upgradeability issues I wanted to mention. There was an exploit recently, uh, audio exploit, probably you, you, saw, uh, you saw in the news or you read about it in, in Twitter. So I wanted to, to go into, into this attack because it was quite interesting, but yeah, to start, related to gradability issues, uh, there are many things that you need to take into account if you want to make a contract upgradable. One of the things that you need to take into account is inheritance. You, you should make sure that all the parent contracts should be correctly initialized. Deployment, the contracts should be deployed and initialized atomically to prevent from running. Like, you cannot, de you cannot deploy a smart contract and leave it there, and one month later you call the initialize function with all the parameters. Bad things may happen then. Um, you may have to redeploy because of that. Also, Open Zeppelin have special libraries to handle upgradability. You should use those, not the normal ones. And 
proxies. Open Zeppelin uh, also got a standard proxy smart contracts. They are built that way for a reason, and you should use those. If you are doing any kind of modification to them, you may have a problem, like it was, like it happened in this case, right? So we are going to speak about the Alice exploit. So in the Alice exploit, there was a storage collision between the proxy contract and the main governance and the implementation itself, which was the, the governance contract. And the collision was in the storage slot zero. Basically, the attacker, thanks to, it, thanks, thanks to this, could reinitialize the contract with the, with the address that he wanted, with the parameters that he wanted. And thanks to that, he was able to pretty much exploit the protocol this way. He created a, a he passed a governance vote and transferred all the funds to himself that way. But this you. OK, so here we can see the code of the proxy contract. We can see in the code that there is a, a variable called proxy admin. And it's taking the slot zero. Uh, this is not very common in the in any proxy contract. So this this already should be should be a, an alarm for, for for any auditor if if they ever find something like this, right? And this is the governance contract, the implementation to which this proxy was pointing. So we can see that also in the storage slot zero, there are two variables that are uh, in the same slot. Initialize and initializing. So, what are those variables? Those variables are used uh, by the initialize, in, initializable contract of Open Zeppelin. It has this modifier here. So, this modifier basically, if the contract is not initialized, you can call this function. If the contract is initializing, you can call this function. So. Let's do some checks. There was a storage collision in the slot zero, right? Between the proxy admin address and the initializing and initialized variables. Initializing was taking these two bytes here. Initialize these last two bytes here. So the proxy, am, I, I did some tests in a fork environment. So these are the results of the test. The proxy admin address was this one. This means that initializing was uh, interpret by the, uh, by the smart contract by false and initialize by true. So we tried to reinitialize the contract as the attacker, but it failed because the contract is already initialized. Good. What happens if the proxy admin address is a different address? Zero, zero now. Before it was zero, one here, right? Initialize now, it's false. So now, as an attacker, we can see here how we change the, the address to, to the new proxy admin address. We can see as an attacker that we were able to reinitialize the smart contract. If you're able to reinitialize the smart contract, you can exploit, can do pretty much what you want with the, with the, with the smart contract. Another case, using this proxy admin address, which is here, we said it here. Initializing is true. Initialize it is true as well. But initializing is true, right? If we go back to the code, if initializing is true, we can do this, all this will be executed, so we can do pretty much what we want. So we can see again that the attacker can initialize the content once again. So that's how the, how the, how the attacker managed to exploit the, the smart contract, because the address had the initializing bytes as this, so it was true, was able to call it again. And at the same time, when I saw this, I was out in another project. So I really got very scared when this exploit happened. And I was like, okay, uh, maybe this project got the same. Uh, so I, I was looking into this, and I saw that the, that the implementation of the code that I was out in back then was this. Quite the same, but immutable. So I read about that. And it's immutable for a reason. But yeah, this was me when I, when I, was, when I found that out, right? Very scared, because the, this project was live. So when you declare a variable as constant or immutable, is that not occupy a slot? They are directly compiled. So 
So this is not taking any storage slot, so we're fine. There is no collision. But if we had removed this immutable, yeah, it, we will have a problem. So this is done this way for a reason. Like, if you, if you didn't know about this, you, you will be thinking, OK, we have a proxy contact here, and the admin is set in the constructor, but you will, ne you will never be able to change again. That's really bad. Why don't you add a setter to change this? Well, if you do that, you are just exposing the smart contact to a storage collision, and that's it. So that's the reason why uh, the contact is built that way. So all good here. So now uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about signature replay attacks, because they are actually quite common. And they're going to be common now with the, with the fork, with the proof of stake uh, fork that is happening very soon. Actually, I'm not sure if today. So. We have this piece of code here that I guess that you won't be able to see it very well. But basically, this is a function that allows uh, people to mint tokens. But to mint tokens, you really need a valid signature signed by this privileged account called signer. So what's wrong with this function? Well, the, the signature is created with the address of the smart contract the amount that you want to send to the user, and the address of the user. OK, all good. So if I want that you receive 100 tokens, I will put here 100. And, in, and here, when I generate the signature, I am going to put your wallet. And here, the address of the smart contract. That's good. So I send you my signature. You use it to call this function. You receive 100 tokens, but you are like, OK, 100 is not enough. I want, I want more. You call it again. You get 200, you call it again, you get 300. And you can call it like multiple times. You, every time that you call it, you will receive 100 tokens. So obviously, this, this is a critical issue. There is a signature replay attack here. This is what I just explained. So how, do you, how could you prevent this? Well, the, the, the way to prevent this is like adding a nonce here. So a nonce that will be increased every time that you call it. So you make sure that this will be only valid one time. Obviously, there are more things that can be, add, that, that can be added here to the smart contract to prevent that, like using domain separators and so on. But in this case, a nonce will be, no, will be enough to prevent this. And finally, I wanted to, to speak about weak pseudo random number generation. Like, uh, in the smart contracts, there is no way to generate a random number on chain. You really need to use an, an external oracle like Chainlink BRF. And in this case that we are going to discuss, uh, the project generated random numbers on chain. And for that, they use message.sender, message which is the, the color of the function, and block timestamp. The, that way, they generate the entropy to, to generate the, the random number. Uh, that's bad already, because block timestamp can be manipulated by miners. But the exploit that we did here is not related to that. So we can forget about it. But our exploit will abuse the message.sender to generate a random number. So this project uh, had something called, uh, this project was launched uh, in Christmas last year, and had something that they call SANT algorithm. Basically, people were minting. And uh, there was a, a little chance that with minting, you will receive up to one ether. So this is the code. Uh, basically, this is the way that they generated the random number. Block timestamp, block difficulty, message sender, and divided by mm, 999, 999. So if you, uh, if you generated a random number which is lower than 1, which means 0, you will receive 1 Ether as a reward. So we, we really want to, to get that Ether when we are minting, right? In this mint function, there is nothing that prevents a smart contract from, from calling this, this mint function. So uh, the NUF, let's say, the NUF way to, to exploit this, right? You create a smart contract. You call the, the mint function six times to get six ether, not just one, because the limit in the smart contract, uh, the limit of times that you can call this function is six. So you want to call it the maximum to get six ether, one per call. You create a smart contract, you put this function here, and you call the min function. Once you call the min function, you check 
if you have received the ether, and if you haven't received the six ether, it means that uh, you didn't win, so you revert. Another approach, which that's what I'm doing here, is that I generate a random number the same way that the other contract is generating it. Block timestamp, block difficulty, and my wallet address, which this will be message.sender. If the random number is uh, higher or equal than one, which will be the same that it's not zero, we revert. If not, we call it, and we get six ether. This is the, um, this approach will require you to send like 1,000 on average transactions to the blockchain and to pay the gas costs for those. So it still will be worth uh, because you are getting six ether and you're paying for 1,000 transactions, but um, you're gonna have to wait a lot. So not very elegant, right? Let's first, before going to the other approach, speak about Create2. So there is an OP code in Solidity called Create2 that give us the ability to predict the address where a contract will be deployed without deploying. So Create2 allows you to deploy, to deploy a smart contract and you know you can predetermine the, the address that, uh, where that smart contract will be deployed. So ca how can we use this to exploit this project? So we're going to deploy a parent contract. This parent contract will make use of Create2 to pre-compute different contract addresses. For each of those contract addresses, the parent contract will check if that generated address will make it win the one ether reward. If that's the case, the parent contract will deploy the song contract on that winning address, and, this, and the song contract will call the min function in the project that we're hacking. If the generated address is not a winning one, we keep looping. So this is the code. Here, uh, we are looping, we are creating different uh, this get address, well, first let's explain piece by piece. So get address, what it does is precalculates the address where create2 is going to deploy the smart contract based on a salt that we're passing. So with get address, if we put, for example, the salt number, number one, we're going to get some address. If we call deploy, this deploy function is calling create2, if we use the, the same salt, one, this will, be, uh, this will be deployed in the same address that we calculated here. So here we check the address where create2 will deploy the smart contract. Here we deploy the smart contract with create2. So we put here, uh, we loop a very high amount. We, pu we pass the, the amount that we want to loop here, let's say 1,000. Uh, here we put the number of mints that we want to do. In this case, the limit is six, so because we only we can only call that function six times, so six. So we start generating uh, random. We start pre-computing different addresses. We put the address here. Okay, what happens if I deploy the smart contract in this address? Uh, what random number I will get? We save it in random number. Is that random number less than one? Is that random number zero? Okay, if it's zero. We deploy the song contract and we call the, the song contract and we're gonna win six ether. If that's not the case, we just keep looping until we get it. So this is the song contract. Song contract is very simple. We just set the new owner address and we call and we just mint in the in the project. And actually, let me show this. Proof of concept, which is a video here. So basically here I am forking the mainnet and I am running the the exploit.py script. So yeah, but it's not being shown in the screen. Dime. Lo tengo que mover, ¿eh? Sí, aquí, aquí. Ya lo tengo. ¿Lo tienes? Ok, so, ya. Yeah. Yeah, it's very small for you guys. Uh, I'm sorry for that because the code was really hard for you to see as well. So, 
sorry for that. So yeah, here basically uh, we can see that the smart contract got this amount of ether and now we are exploiting the smart contract, we can see that we got six ether minus the minting cost and we keep decreasing the balance of the smart contract with our exploit and we keep getting more and more ether here until we eventually manage to drain all the, all the smart, all, all the ether from the smart contract. There are some times that we are looping here 2,000 times. There are some times that we are not lucky enough and this transaction is not going to drain any ether because we didn't get, we, we didn't become winner in those 2,000 tries. But as we can see, most of the times we're getting it. Like we can see here, it's decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. As you can see, it takes a lot to execute because it's looping so many times. So yeah. Okay, so that's everything. Uh, if you guys have any questions, if you really want to ask something. Something basic. Yeah. It looked like you were passing an address for the uh, initialization. Yeah. Why would you have that initialization as part of an address? Uh, okay, let me get back to that. Okay, so look, uh, here, this is the proxy contract, and um, proxy contract points to the implementation. Proxy contract got this address, the address of the administrator of the proxy. This address is the address that can perform uh, operations in the proxy, like upgrading the proxy and so on. It's taking the storage slot zero. This is the implementation. In the implementation, we have two different variables for the implementation. Initialize and initialization. So, uh, there is a storage collision there. So, if the proxy admin got these, uh, these bytes, the, the, four, the four last bytes are the only ones important in this case, got these bytes, it means that the implementation will, uh, will have or will be interpreted this way. Yeah. Why would that fundamentally be a part of an address? To tell something what to do rather than just be an address. I don't understand your question here. Like why are those last two bytes actually there? Okay. Is that just because it's a proxy? Are you familiar with Solidity proxies and how they work? Not deeply, no. Okay. So Yeah. Okay, so let me see how I can explain this. Uh, the proxy is, uh, is used in Solidity to be able to, to do a grade. Like in Solidity, if you deploy a smart contract, you won't be able to, the code will be there forever, you won't be able to change it. So uh, we, we made this mechanism which is using a proxy that points to implementation. In this case, the proxy got this address. Uh, the proxy can be managed by this address, proxy admin. And it, po it is pointing to this implementation, which is a different contract. But the thing is that the proxy will hold all these, all these storage slots that the implementation got here in the proxy itself. But in this case, because there is, they are trying, there is this variable declared here, there is a collision. They are trying to save in the same slot the address of the guy that is going to manage the proxy and the value of these two variables. This, this will never happen, that's the problem. Like, you are trying to save this state variable 
and these two state variables in the same slot, and they are totally different. They, they, they shouldn't be, it shouldn't be done that, that way. That's, that's the reason. Yeah. That's, that's just good. Okay. Yeah, my personal opinion related to this is that uh, at least smart contracts will never be as secure as, uh, let's say, web pages currently. And web pages currently are not very secure, you know that already. Well, so I don't really think that the smart contracts will be as secure in the future. Like, smart contracts are so, so complex, and one single line, one single mistake in a, in a letter, or you are using a, a grown variable somewhere, that can mean uh, millions of, of losses. So, do you think uh, there's anything to do on the language side of things, or is it all for the developers using the language? There are some issues that are, uh, can be linked to solidity, but I really think that it's not, uh, if we were using another language, it would be the same. Like, in, my, in one of my first slides, I was mentioning that one of the most common bugs are logic errors. Logic errors are going to be in every single language. Yeah. So the thing here in Web3 with the smart contracts, people are building crazy projects, crazy complex projects. It's very easy to, to, to make a mistake. And I think that's, 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 the, that's the thing. So I don't really think that ever the smart contracts will be as secure as, let's say, a normal website as we know today. Uh, still, I think that you can really reach a very high uh, level of security, but you're going to have to put a lot of efforts on that. Like, make sure that your code is audited by different firms, make sure that the code was developed since the, since the day one, thinking about security. Like, you know, if you're building a project like, let's say, a staking project or some kind of project that is going to, to save people money, you really need to... Uh, Instead of focusing on the functionality, it's important, but the, the most important thing there is the security since day one. If you, if you don't take that into account, you will have problems. So you really need to invest with an internal security team that develops the smart contracts thinking in security, but after that, you will need more eyes that will look in, into your code, back bounties, and so on. Like, there are, at the moment, there are many projects out there that are really, really, really complex, and they haven't been exploited. So mm, that proves that it is possible to build in Web3 to build uh, great things in a, in a right way, right? But uh, still, I think that uh, as secure as a normal website, that's going to be tough in the future, yeah. I wanted to ask you, you said before that there is no way uh, to build an automated tool to test these errors, but there are very well known A lot of errors can be, that's it, like, that's it, like, you see here, this, this, was, this was built with a tool. I run a tool and I got the storage of this contract. So if you put some effort, for sure, you could have detected this error. Like, I am sure that I could create, it will take me some time, right, but I could create some tool that scans all the smart contracts deployed in the Ethereum, uh, in the Ethereum mainnet, checks the proxy address, check the implementation address, compares the storage slots of both, and see if there is a collision. And if there is a collision, notify the project owners and so on. This, this case could, could have been detected this way. A logic error, that, there is no way for that. And that's the most common thing, right? So, but for sure, there are many tools that are very helpful in audits, and there are a lot of tools that can be built to, to help in security. That's it, yeah. Yeah, like a Slicer, a Slicer is very known. Uh, a lot of developers use it. 
I use it in, in my audits to, to check for low-hanging fruits, for, for references, to check all the output of a slicer, see if there is something there. But the bad thing about the slicer is that it, it just prints a big wall of test in your, in your computer, and you really need to check line by line if it's not a false positive. And 99% of it is false positive every time. So. Okay, so thank you for coming. Voy a quitarlo. <laughs>